Hi, everybody. My name is Miles Ward, and this is Cloud and Clear. It's a little podcast we pulled together to bring the very best of technology in the Google Cloud ecosystem onto the stage for you to take a look at how everybody is working together, what able people are able to do with this platform, and what's coming next. Hi. I am super excited about this this session. This one's going to be really, really fun. Uh, we have maybe one of the feistiest uh, guests that we're, we're ever going to be able to have on this platform. Mark, uh, Mark Etherington has been uh, a great partner of ours, and I'm really excited to have a conversation today. Mark, say hi to everybody. Thanks, Miles. And uh, no, we did not wear the old coordinate <laughs> shirt separately. And I've already had a go at Miles about the fact he should be in a Hawaiian shirt. So good to see That's you. Right. And uh, nice to be here. Thanks very much. Awesome. Well, for, for folks in the uh, in the audience, can you maybe walk through, uh, you know, what Crux is, how you got there? Sure. Give us the give us the background. Yeah, cool. Um, well, Crux, let's start with Crux and then we'll, we'll work back through history. Yes? But, but Crux is focused on uh, effectively removing friction between data suppliers and data consumers. Now, there's a lot to unpack there, but, but in essence, at the very macro level, we try to connect to a data supplier in whatever way they want to, to make it really easy to get onto the platform. And for a consumer, we make it all, uh, all the vendors look effectively the same and we deliver their data in the way that the client wants. So think of it as a really big data uh, uh, mux in the middle. And of course, if you've got data going through the middle, you can add lots of services on the back of that. You can do validation services. You can add metadata. You can build some really interesting database views, which we'll come to later. Um, and you're in the ability to really add a lot of, you like, semantic value in that processing. And our stated intent is to basically try and help data engineering in teams in either consumers or suppliers and, and basically help do the things which are not value added for them, but are necessary, but are really important for people to get data across. Now, the journey is a bit more interesting. So uh, I've been in, the, <laughs> been in the industry a number of years. Um, God, I, I was trying to think about this as we were talking about it earlier. It's like, yeah, I'm one of those sad people that started life with like a ZX81 and TRS-80 and yeah. oh, all those sort of things, uh, much to my wife's uh, disappointment, I think, over the years. Um, but no, I started back in, I guess, ooh, must be really young. And then I ended up at a, uh, I ended up doing systems engineering at college. And then I went into a software house, which was the, D the rigger back in the late eighties. Yeah. Uh, worked for one in the UK. Um, mortgage rates in the UK went to 15%. If anyone could ever believe that around that time. Just getting married, exactly. Just getting married and uh, decided to join one of those nasty things called a bank. And I ended up uh, working at something I'd never heard before. It's, it's a small little undertaking called JP Morgan. Uh, <laughs> so I went in for a year. <laughs> yes, it, it's an interesting time when you're, you're this naive in the 20s and you're not quite sure what you're doing, uh, that you want to do good technology. And it was good fun. I mean, great fun. I, I went in for a year and stayed 15. Um, and then I, uh, I guess I went to another small bank after that so i joined goldman sachs uh oh, straight yeah. after that so i worked <laughs> out, in goldman out, Sachs, out of pan and into the fire or something like that <laughs> well, it's, uh, they're good training grounds let's put yeah. it that way so uh joined goldman's back in mid 2000s um spent nearly a decade there had a lot mm. of fun on both jp and goldman's actually um ended up running things where you can call it you know i did a lot of development work but i also then slipped into the dark side of infrastructure at mm. the tail end of jp exactly so uh the dark side of having somebody that actually was a user go into the provider if you like in the way the firms work was really interesting and that pulls you into yeah, lots of things around financials, to, to be honest. Yeah, So I ran distributed engineering pretty much for both firms. And as you as you start looking at the, as you become more senior in tech, you start looking at more and more the cost structure, the flexibility, how do you meet the, the suppliers and so forth. So I got pulled into that a lot, which took me towards the cloud, obviously, even in the early days. Sure. And then got dragged into, uh, I ended up leading the team that built the private cloud for, for Goldman's. And there's a lot of interesting lessons that came out of that. Oh, yeah. um, did a lot of consortium work. Ended up going into a spin-off of, uh, of the company, sold that to Thomson Reuters. Uh, Thomson became Refinitiv. Uh, I, I, I sort of got a taste with this, the smaller players at that stage, to be honest, having done the sure. startup thing. So Offer came along to try and actually change the way data is done. And mm. lo and behold, uh, about 18 months ago, I joined Crux as the CTO, which I think was almost to the day the day you joined SADA as the yeah, CTO. No, we, yeah, we're, yeah we, it was like we, we have a parallel path, which I think is spectacular. I've been watching your growth. I, I, I know you guys have been eyeballing ours too uh, and really appreciate the partnership to date. And that, you know, I, I think that 
that trajectory one is exemplary. I, I don't know many that would have the same kind of um, you know breadth and depth of experience at these sort of macro scale businesses where it has to work and it has to rock right. Um, but also to to see the kind of through line of systematization and automation and making it so that these kinds of things are generating real business value. I think you know what I saw in the original parts of the crux, crux pitch was this just dramatically more pragmatic view that says, yeah, 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 you, you know, <laughs> yes, you you have a bunch of data coming from different places. Of course, that's a pain. You need it to go to a bunch of different places. Of course, that's a pain too. You know, how do we work the very hard central problem there in the middle of reducing the friction for everybody? That's, yeah. uh, yeah, I don't have any customers that don't want that. <laughs> yeah, so we'll send them along. But I think the, the, the issue that we've also found as well is that, you know, people, yeah, there's a lot of discussion on cloud. I mean, like you guys live and breathe it. Yeah, I'm very, yeah. very fortunate. I, I inherited a cloud native company. So rather than having to drive people to the cloud, it, yeah, came into an organization that was set there. up for the cloud. Yeah, yeah, it's very easy. But the problem you start to see with like, if you, if you look at some of the supply, if you look, there's, there's two big dynamics we see at the moment. With this one. You look at the suppliers, yeah? I mean, to, everybody talks about the big players. So you've got the Bloombergs, the Refinitives. Now, sure. now, with due respect to them, that they deserve their position in the market, but it's come through a lot of hard work and it's come mm. through with an awful lot of money and mm. a lot of focus and a lot of staff. Not everybody in the data world, and I would argue the vast majority of people in the data world have that. Yep. It's it's a scale game. So you've got an awful lot of players out there that actually are very good at data and actually not so hot at technology, or they are good at technology, but the problem is that where's their focus needing to be? So how do they actually help? So every time you get a channel, it's an additional cost structure to them without necessarily a revenue structure. So how do you remove that inhibitor for them to help the cloud? And what consumers see on the other side is, is as, as they clearly migrate to the cloud, well, do you really want your cloud solution to be to forward your FTP delivery to right. the cloud? And if you don't, which is sort of, I would suggest, is probably not the ideal solution, then it's how not. do you get the suppliers who can't focus on it to do that? Yeah. So we're, we're sort of playing on the cloud migration piece of this puzzle a bit as well. And there's, it's one of our difficulties, to be honest, is there are so many use cases to actually plug in that you know, as a, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of a weird startup in that we have an extreme amount of experience in the team itself, a lot of backgrounds in trading, a lot of uptime, a lot of data focus on it, a lot of understanding market data. So we go into it with our eyes open, but you look at the landscape and there's like, ah, well, if you structure, if you just call it that, it's the same thing. And there's lots of the same thing packaged in different ways to add value to both ends of the spectrum. It's, it's a really fascinating business to be in. I didn't realize I'd end up in data after trying to manage it for so many years, but it's good fun. Well, yeah, I mean, there's there's huge parallels in what you're off doing to what the cloud providers themselves have had to do. I remember really, really early on the Amazon side, you know, them couching the primary value proposition to an IT buyer of making it so they didn't have to tell the difference between the different hardware platforms that they happen to be deployed on today and that you just got this sort of single unified API for interacting with computers. And, and uh, we're trying to explain even at that early era to developer managers on the platform team, no, 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 there's a benefit to the developers too, I promise. It makes it so that they don't have to think about any of this stuff and they get to build their application just one time instead of having to retest it against a bunch of different pieces. So you're, you're seeing that same simplification of the supplier's experience and the buyer's experience, but just up a layer at the data yeah, level, it's, which I think it's, is really powerful. Absolutely. And what we're seeing, it's interesting. So it depends on who you're talking to, yeah? Because one of my, um, look, there's lots of different analogies of what we do, and most of them trivialize or try to hide the complexity. But one I actually like the best, but I don't get to use that often, is Docker for data. So if you think of it as a consistent interface, I mean, it's, it's a it's a tongue in cheek, but we try to make all data taste like chicken. I mean, if you remember the, yeah, it's like, how do you put the consistent wrapper around things to make sure that the semantic access, the, the way that you actually even think about what is the latest data that you've got? How do I actually understand how to join two data sets together? How, you, you call it, oh, it good English American, yeah? I say potato, you say potato. It's the same vegetable at the end of the day. That happens in data all over the place. And if only it was only just you know <laughs> those vegetables. So it, it's it's very akin to actually how do you make put ubiquity without losing 
I guess proprietoriness of the data. We don't want to ever undermine a supplier's data value. To be honest, sometimes you 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 don't like what you see as a consumer and you need it manipulated. So we try to offer services to do wrangles and so forth on top. But it is the value that's been licensed by the consumer. On the other side of it, what, what suppliers sometimes don't realize is that you know, much as if they'd love to be the only supplier to a consumer, frankly, that's a little bit rare, even with the Bloombergs and the Refinitives, for that to be the case. So you're in this awful situation as a consumer of trying to understand the nuances. Why did that supplier not put the ingestion date on the data? Why do I have, yeah, versus why did that one do it? But why did they do it in a different date form? All of those type of things, these little nuances add up to an awful lot of inefficiency for the consumer and for the supplier. So that, that's the basic play in the middle that we're trying to actually get into. I mean, there's the, there's the inefficiency of, of the, and the friction associated with noodling that out once. But every single combination of consumers and producers has to do it over again, right? So, you know, I don't know how many, what the current customer count is, right? Like, I'm sure it's, it's massive, but every single one of those is able to take benefit from a central solution to that problem. And it's like, it, it's even narrower than, you know, I think like in hardware and in data centers and things like that, you had people that had, you know, very exotic weird shapes that they needed to fit their software. But but data, it feels like it's an even more uniform need to get this stuff sorted yeah, and so, organized in a way that's useful because yep. it's not, uh, you know, there isn't that kind of diversity of use cases. So, so the I, centralization I think, helps better. I'm completely there. I mean, the, the thing, though, to realize, if you just take a practical step backwards, yeah, hmm. so I, I, have, I actually have, having run a bunch of infrastructure for the banks, I, I, I sort of know... And I know the nasty questions to ask, okay, because I usually mm-hmm. try to avoid them. But it's things like when you ask somebody just the very basics, how long does it take you to open a firewall port to take a connection from a new supplier? I mean, you, you feel as if people want you to sign an affidavit that you're never going to tell anyone. But it's right. like, it, it can run from, from if you're really lucky and you built a kick-ass, good, solid cloud-based, you add all the buzzwords in, you mm-hmm. can do it in seconds if you know what you're doing. Right. But realistically, a bank, <laughs> yeah, maybe 12 weeks if, yeah. you're, if you're lucky, and in some cases more than that. So yeah. just even the establishing the connectivity, and then once you get through the connectivity, making sure it runs every day, so there's operational elements to this, and then making sure you actually understand what you've got. How do you even trial data? I mean, this business is, uh, is rife with people buying things without trying them. Yeah. I mean, would you buy a car? Now, admittedly, people seem to be buying houses in COVID without actually yeah. seeing them. But I'm, I'm not it. sure. <laughs> but I'm not sure I'm going to buy a data set on credit card debt in, in Japan yeah. like that. So, well, you know, it's it's a very interesting point. And if you're, you know, we have business buyers who look at this space and say, wow, sounds like I'm going to have to pay for a lot of repetitive, redundant stuff that other my competitors are doing. I'm not going to do it any different from them. That that seems like a bad business investment. You talk to the technologists who go, I'm going to hire and train engineers to do the same repetitive, dumb thing that I, they would do someplace else. And we, like we bear all the same burden and any of the debt of change, we're going to end up being the ones that pay that down. Like there, I, there isn't anybody who across the different you know disciplines are going to say, oh, this is a great idea. We should do that totally manually from scratch ourselves, right? In the same way as we go to customers <laughs> all the time and say, like, if you're not planning on vending the hardware you buy to third parties, you shouldn't buy it, right? Like, let the central providers do this in a more efficient way. I think you're in the same spot on the So I, I, I find, yeah, it's very much, but it's, it's a very, you're right, it's very strong overlaps. Yeah. So look, I've run major virtualization programs in the big firms, okay? And it, it's quite surprising how many people sort of intellectually get it, but don't really you know, emotionally get it. So you always have like, the, I mean, if you remember the analogy of like server huggers yeah, in terms of the fact that so now, if you're playing this game at scale yeah. and you just, can define Just for visuals, means, I will hug a server just for the purposes <laughs> okay, of this process. I, I, don't, I, I would say that I've got a netbook, but I haven't. I've got a really nice Mac. But the... The problem that you see with this stuff is like even in, even if you intellectually get it, it's all about asset sweat, mm-hmm. to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. And if you can get, if you like the what's the average utilization of a service that is like less than five percent of people fess up mm-hmm. about what's going on. And every time the bit that really gets me is the storage. 
Yeah. Because it's like you think, you know, I, I've not, I, if I had a dollar for every time somebody asked me, why is, this, is, you know, why is the firm storage so expensive? Well, it's because we keep 16 copies of the stuff and we replicate it 15 ways from Sunday. So that's not the same as what's running on your laptop. Yeah. So there's, there's lots of different inefficiencies with the base infrastructure stack, which is very analogous to the data. Because the data is actually worse. Because if you think back to the bad old days where you know, you were on this you know, race to the fastest, bestest, you know, spend ten grand on the next you know, key chip that's going to get you the microsecond that you're going to do. Well, to be honest, that's sort of what you're doing with your staff in the data business. Because if you were employing people that wanted to do the data engineering, let's separate engineering from science, okay? So if we think about engineering as much more, you know, not so much the plumbers of the world, but certainly you're doing much more data manipulation to get things ready for consumption. Yeah, into a position where it's tidy, neat, it's straight, it's it's predictable. Then you're actually in many cases taking either infrastructure folks that have better better jobs to do, honestly, than doing that and trying to cross train them to do that. Or you're getting even worse. You're going to you're fighting at the universities, you're fighting in the marketplace for top notch data scientists. And then you're making them effectively do the you know, do the equivalent of washing the dishes before you actually. And there's always an expression in, in English which is where there's muck, there's brass. But there's really just the same expressions that go through. It's like you need to be focused on what's meaningful for you. And this is this is interesting because I think everybody thinks that we did a look back on how long's the cloud been here. It's actually not that long. Yeah, I mean I've tried to do people like when did you get a BlackBerry type of games as well. It's not. It's like What's a BlackBerry is now the answer. But, you know, it's like they're in, there's a world here where the, you know, honestly, the target is just so liberating. The flexibility that you have with compute and storage and distribution needs to be countered or balanced with an understanding of the data and a purity around the data that makes it actually easy to consume. And there's lots of issues here. It's like some of them aren't technical, contractual, entitlements, contract flows. How do you get permissioned? And then we finally get into the cloud. And that's where, you know, where obviously we intersected with you guys big time. And it's like you need the technology that's that's suitable to deliver it in the way the client wants it. And you need to be open to the fact that sometimes what you've chosen is not what the client wants. And that's where the supplier's infraction comes into this as well. It's uh, you know, not, nothing's, nothing's new in this industry. <laughs> no, no. Well, and so, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of a slide um, you know, we would talk to customers about Google Cloud and they would say, oh, I'm really I'm really good at computers. I, I, I know how to do the security stuff. And then we would lay out like, here are the eight different layers of security that Google thinks about in its structure. And here are the sort of different initiatives and the components that we take on. And here's the spots in our responsibility. And, you know, it would take about seven minutes of what we had planned for a half an hour to talk about that. And they would go, stop, stop, stop. You do a hundred times more stuff than I do. I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll shush, right? Like, Thank you. You know, that box has now been checked, you know, and I think, you know, it's not a, a point of trying to get to rational drowning. I think if you are going to be the provider that does this in the middle, you bear a higher burden of, of a, a really, you know, sophisticated system to be able to handle the full scope of complexities, not only of a single customer, but of your group of customers. How, how you know, I know Google Cloud has been a, a part of that. Help me connect the dots for customers, right? What what out of the platform has been a useful ingredient in making it so you can build the best in the world. Okay, and I'll tell you a couple of surprising ones as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it was it was interesting as with with you know, it's always good to reflect occasionally on, on how you've ended up where you've ended up. And sometimes you're you know, but usually it's like it's worked out quite well. But I think the the security thing is important, okay, to to take the lead. I also think it's interesting. So yet many people like when, when we deal with customers, that there's a wide gamut, okay, but you've got people that actually do want to move to the cloud, but their internal security departments are not fans. And that's education largely. Okay. And that's that's rife. And the, interestingly, now the, the the way I usually turn this is, well, have you spoken to why don't you just talk to your cloud provider? Now, whether that's proxied and that you know SADA steps in. But if you look at who are who actually defines and runs security for the big cloud companies, and I know Google's mm -hmm. quite well, I actually know them. Sure. So those guys have a, an extremely interesting background. And if you look at it from my perspective, finance is, is a good leader in terms mm -hmm. of what it needed to do. And there's some extremely good skills. So I point them actually to go talk to the cloud providers. I said, well, well why? I said, well, well, first of all, it's their job 
to convince you to use them. So they would have had to have gone so much more. And the next statement is what they don't get is that they've got better security than you, almost guaranteed. Now, there might be a few there, probably don't talk about the government quite like that, but you're not in a situation where most companies, certainly of, you know, if I say mid-range and even really large, are as good at security as any of the cloud providers, to be honest, because your business is toast yeah. if it's not. So yeah. there's, there's, there, there is a need there to do it. But what's been interesting for, for me, and it, it's funny because we spoke to like the, the big query uh, mm-hmm. product managers, yeah? Great guys. Yeah. And, and they're, all, they're all about, is it the product? Well, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Only partially. <laughs> well, yeah. What do you mean? It's going to be the product. The product's fantastic. Well, actually, BigQuery is underrated and is actually a very good product. But the, the, but the things that are compelling are actually a little bit different. So the things that we've ended up using, and, and it's quite an interesting anecdote. I asked, we were setting up um, actually like a read-only account to put, create a sandbox for a client. And I just wanted to see it personally. I wanted to feel what the client experience was going to be like for the first login. And, to, and, and unfortunately, it just worked. And what I mean by that, and I mean, unfortunately, this was I was expecting to see what it looked like from a client perspective. But because I already had my Google login, it just opened. It all been permission. And, I, and I'm like, I'm, I'm shouting at my infrastructure head saying, well, no, I wanted to see what it's like. Well, I can't do it. I <laughs> mean, it's like, okay, it works. So that, that you know, joking aside, that integration is, is extremely important. And what people don't necessarily get is, you know, not every supplier will automatically have ODBC drivers that work. Sure. That, that you can plug in. If you're, if, you know, I got to wash my mouth there. If you're a Power BI user talking to, you know, a, a Google backend, it will work. And it will work out the tin. It's not. It's not a question of you know switching off the OS and installing some fuzzy driver. Right. right. That, You're not that, in there that, causing yeah. Hit mayhem. Yeah. It just no, turns out. And, and, and there are plenty of providers where that is the case. So, so one level, the integration of the ecosystem is enabling for us because if we've got the data in the system, then we can offer it in actually more innovative ways. I mean, it sounds silly. But analysts do actually want to get access to data via Excel. That does demand you to have a level of integration on security, identity, as well as the actual tangible connection of the drivers. So that's a very big help. Commercially, I think you're well positioned, or Google's very well positioned for this, because there are multiple tracks here. Some people charge for you know, loading data. Some people charge for ES. You need to, you know, the cloud providers themselves generically need to understand what they, how they want to position this. But what I'm certainly seeing positioned is the ability for us to load data without real, shall I say, commercial considerations. Yeah, the fact that I can load data, load it fast, and not pay for that load other than storage, which I can compress, is a big enabler to the business models that we're trying to do, and certainly for data suppliers. If you're a data mux, then reality is you have a lot of data. So being in an ability to load it, manipulate it, store it, and do that on a very commercial basis is probably, yeah, if not the most important, is up there. So there's probably about four or five of these. The real killer is actually support. And I mean support on both the, yeah, Miles, why is this not working? Again, you told me it was going to work versus, exactly. But this is the interesting point is that I'm okay Okay, I'll have fun with you about something not working. But the difference that I get actually with Google and SADA is you will go and fix it. Or you'll tell me intellectually that I'm smoking dope and I need to do things a different way. And that's okay too. But it it is an intellectual transparency and honesty that's required. And I don't think, and this this is what I find very surprising, I don't think Google's lost the gene to actually care. And it's like, admittedly, I position things as, did you know that Snowflake does this better? And that gets an awful lot of response. And actually, no, it doesn't do it better. Or we're going to do this. Or Synapse does that. And we're going to do this. That There is actually a passion there that means that when you end up with edge point, edge cases, and they're typically edge cases, then you actually do get focus. But we seem to run into a lot of edge cases occasionally. So... So it's interesting to see that the reaction to it is that product take it seriously. You've, if you, if as long as you're you're positive in how you put things, that you show what the use cases are, I find that the support people will bend over backwards to help us make sure it's there. When occasionally a product manager perhaps has oversold the capability, 
the tech support stuff. Goodness me, that never happens. Huh? Yeah, you're in a <laughs> but you're in a position at least then where actually the account team pick up the pieces and will work through the realities and get you up and running. And, and I have glowing reports you know, from both the team and my own personal experiences with working with the team to make sure that actually we're not always right, even though we're the customer, but we are important and we do need help. And getting that whole flow going, I think, is, is absolutely critical. I, I am not going to be referred to Stack Overflow as my support staff, okay? Right. That's not the way to do this game. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. does happen as well. So. Yeah. No, I'm, so I, I, I appreciate the positive feedback. And I think it's an experience that we're, we're trying to help as many you know customers as we can have. Um, and it's, it is certainly a spot where, you know, as much as, uh, you know, Google Cloud isn't the biggest of the providers by direct revenue, I think where it is is really important for the experience of the customers that are on the platform because they are hungry and they are pushing and uh, and our ability to interact with them in that lens to say, no, 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 we think this customer is doing things that is representative of the future of the platform. We really need you to lean in on these pieces. That's That's helping the overall system continue to meet customers where they are and take them to what's next. That's what's got me fired up. Yeah, and I'm very, I mean, I'm very pro, to be honest, because in a number of cases, you know, it's like being building a product, you've got use cases that you need to go after. There's a specific set of dynamics you're expecting. A lot of what's actually we hit are soft limits because the developers didn't necessarily want to go in a certain direction. But that's fine. The explanation, soft limits are easy. The harder stuff is also addressed, though. I think that's that's important for us because to trust a platform, I've got to be in a position where that platform works. And, and frankly, BigQuery does work and it works really well. But that's that's table stakes. Yeah. Next week, Synapse will have something. The week after Snowflake, two weeks after that, you'll have that game of database hopscotch is goes on for years. Yeah. So or leapfrog. So it, it's like I'm okay with that piece because I know eventually with the right emphasis, we'll get the products exactly how uh, that we want. But to make sure that it's commercially viable, to make sure the supports there, make sure that people listen when you've got concerns is key. The other thing I think just as, as a, and this is sort of bizarre, I've raised this a couple of times, is the thing that that, that I think Google, it's, it's going to sound really weird, Miles, but... but <laughs> I like weird, but, I, you know, I'm, but, but, I resemble that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but, but big, big, you know, big query is a cloud. And I don't, th- I don't sure. think you guys make enough of the fact that it is a cloud. And let's give oh, you yeah. an example of this, yeah? It's like, for me, operationally, I know that if I load the data in there and I need to make that data set available to a European customer, I don't actually have to do much work. And I'm inherently yeah. lazy. So I mm. like that. Yeah. Most of the other solutions, that's not always true, but most of the other solutions, that are certainly third parties, are riding on the cloud. They're not a cloud. And that it sounds like acutism, but it's not. It has real practical implications. Because I can trust with BQ that I don't, I can reliably say the data, yeah, you want it in Ireland, it'll be there. It's there now, actually. Would you like me to switch it on? Versus actually, no, let me set up a replication network. Let me let me make sure I've got a record of the data. I've got to think about my egress costs. Oh, I've still got multi-cloud issues, and I do support multiple clouds, and clients, unfortunately, don't all choose Google. It would make my life a lot easier if they did, but they don't. So you still got to do things, but that that cloud aspect of what it is is meaningful from a devops perspective a support perspective a a feeling and frankly time to market perspective so there's a, a more of an emphasis around actually yes google is a cloud but these products are clouds in their own right and run on top of you know probably one of the best network clouds in the world to be honest i love amazon yeah, I'm not paid by Amazon, not paid by Google, I'm not paid by Microsoft, but you actually have a number of assets in there, not just the compute, the network, the presence, the support. It, the package itself is actually quite compelling, I think. I, I, I really appreciate that. I, I, you know, I saw the foundation of, of that advantage as this, every one of the products that's a part of GCP that's an externalization of the pre-built internal systems on the Google side, where the default expectation is, yes, I have to be in every country. Yes, I have to be under 100 milliseconds to every human alive, stuff like that. Uh, and that drove that requirement that predates even the public cloud offering is present as this kind of underlying value proposition in so many of the products that are there. And as that 
product line expands, right? We're really bullish about BigQuery Omni and being able to bring the BigQuery experience to Amazon, to other locations. Um, you know, we, we keep pushing on the same product managers that you're talking about. Like, yes, the compute side is important. You know, it turns out that storage side is even more important and a bigger, bigger pain point for most customers. And that, that ability to like, exactly like you described, just sort of hmm, leverage Google's global backbone and incredible replication and distribution of data technology to make it so that this stuff is all available where customers need it in the context that they need it. That's a, that's a big lift that I think is yeah, I, underappreciated. I think- Absolutely. And I think you, where you guys you know, play well is like, to be honest, not everyone knows the questions to ask. So having having someone to say, well, had you thought about? Yeah, because it's like, it, it's you know, you're plumbing into any of the big database vendors. Yeah, everyone assumes it's this pan-galactic network of databases and stuff. It's, you know, it, it doesn't work that way, folks. Yeah, you've actually got real wires here, real setups. I mean, maybe you're you're lucky enough to be a, you know, a Docker, Kubernetes, whatever. But you still, unfortunately, there is the speed of light. There is a network. You Do you really want to manage it or do you want to abandon that that nightmare and move to the cloud? I, I'm, I'm being honest here. I'm not going back to a non-cloud world again in my career. No, it's, no. It's, just, it's ridiculous. Well, it was, it's great. Like we, we keep banging into, uh, you know, because of how much work we've been doing on the Antho side where you sort of like drop out of cloud speed and back into manual transmission and having to sort of fight your way through each of these pieces. And, uh, you know, and it, it really reminds you how, how big that benefit is like, oh, you, you you don't have to wait for them to ship another line card. And hmm, like we don't run out of RAM, like, like it's such a silly stuff, but it's so it's, it's a funny one because so our core development and infrastructure staff mm-hmm. are all trading background. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And quite a few of us have done high speed messaging, low late, mm-hmm. genuine low latency, yeah. yeah, line card <laughs> levels and all this other stuff, yeah. kernel yeah. patches. None, none of these adorable none milliseconds we're so back. fine of, right? Yeah. <laughs> no one wants to go back there. But yeah. but what's interesting in terms of you look at the trends is where all of the providers are going, specifically where Google's going. Now, obviously, a bit very careful about NDAs and stuff here, but but what's going on with the real time world is getting really interesting. Yeah. So it's like I've been on a number of panels about you know, you know, real time in the cloud. Is it there? It is really close oh, yeah. actually to being good enough for many use cases. Not not all of them, but it's getting pretty close for some of these things, to be honest. One, one of the ones we pushed on really hard, we're super bullish to see some of the early results. This quote that came out boggles the mind. I love it. Where uh, in BigQuery, you can now enable this thing called BI Engine, where you can, yep. and originally it was like, oh, no more than 10 gigs, like, got to be really, really tiny. And now it's like, yeah, 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 bring, we'll assign terabytes of RAM to your stuff. Uh, and we've got customer after customer that are building these big public web-facing dashboard systems. And they're going like, uh, I have never had the back end engine be the lowest latency part of the whole serving stack, including the web layer, including like the image serving part of what we do as yep. like, this is all backwards and weird. What, what dark magic have you people done over there? But the biggest, biggest thing about BI engine is it's completely opaque to the client. It can be. Yeah. So the fact is you don't have to do anything to use it. Or oh, you need very, very little amount of config to actually make your full use of that. And so there's loads of dashboarding type of, of things that are out there. I'm at the other side of it as well, because it's funny, we, we recently, we're, we're uh, about to announce, we've got a, a great uh, venue in the UK publishing prices. Obviously, they do trading off it themselves. We're actually subscribing to that via Fix. We run a Fix engine in Google. We subscribe to the messages and we get those messages into and there's a lot of them here obviously in what we're doing here we get them into bigquery and i'm and for any client that's going to sign up for this i'm not giving this as an sla but we saw this at something like sub second from a exit from the venue into our fix engine in the states okay into bq in god knows where it is because it's a cloud who cares into the db and it was remarkable. Now you can't, you might not be able to do. You're certainly not doing low latency trading off that. But you know, there's an awful lot of like click trading, you know, web page updating. There's replay services, tick repos. There's a whole load of products that are enabled with the base infrastructure. And I and I had a had a great one talking to the product manager. I was like, so how much are you going to charge me for this? And he goes, oh, we only charge for egress. We well, charge me for storage too, but so you're telling me I can access anywhere in the world, pump this stuff in, and get it into BQ for the, basically the price of a bit of rust spinning on some disk somewhere. Yeah, great. Now that's that's leverage. 
Yeah. And when, 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 when we spoke to the CEO of the company at the other side of it, the client, yeah, already his brain's turning into ideas about how to change how he does the business. Can I now, oh, that means I can take two different message queues and put them, I have one in Hong Kong, one in Japan, one in Singapore, run my venues out there just by standing up in the cloud? Uh, yeah, it's a little harder than that, but it's not a lot harder than that. Yeah, This is not time machine invention time. It's getting pretty close to being able to do some really innovative architectures. And Google's actually the forefront of this stuff, which I think is really good. The others will catch up, but... These guys are doing a good job. There's this, uh, you know, I'll, I'll leave you with this metaphor. There's this great scene from Pumping Iron, the Arnold Schwarzenegger documentary, right? When he's running up for Mr. Olympia and it's him versus uh, the guy who played the Hulk, uh, right? And uh, and the two of them are uh, uh, Lou Ferrigno. And Lou's dad is his trainer, right? Like they have no money. It's like this tiny little no budget scene. And they're in competing against like the hero, the superstar of Arnold Schwarzenegger. And they have this breakfast. And uh, at the breakfast, you know, uh, they kind of ask for Arnold's opinion. How do you think we're going to do? And Arnold starts, he says, you know, oh, you know, Joe, you know, Joe looks great. And Lou, Lou looks good. He's, he's going to do awesome. You know, it, maybe if he had like, you know, a little more head start, a little more prep, uh, you know, a couple more weeks, then then he'd be able yeah. to catch up. And then he follows and then he pauses and go, well, but then I would have a couple more weeks. And well, then, you know, then I'd still be ahead. Right. So exactly. I think there's one of those things where, yes, I absolutely expect 100 percent of the capabilities that Google offers today to be caught up. From, you know, and like I remember talking to analysts like, you know, when do you think the gap between Amazon and GCP will close. And I, I would say, yeah, I think in three or four years, Amazon will catch up technically to what GCP is. And they'd sort of spit out their coffee and be like, what are you talking about? I think Amazon's in the lead. I'm like, well, that's on the dollars. I don't know if that's on the tech. So there's- No, you're right. Um, I mean- what I've, been, what I've been blown away by is the roadmap, right? Like they are not stopping. They are pouring engineers into this thing. And, and it's really going to be incredible, the superpowers that come out the other side. Oh, I mean, it's like, it's like if, if anyone's in, in doubt, BQ is the gateway to Google. I mean, it's like if you can get everything in there, yeah, and certainly, I mean, that's that's a lot of sympathy. I mean, it's like it's great to be supported, but we're doing a lot of work with Google themselves in terms of where they want to go with data too. If you can get things in, yeah, then you you have a world of opportunity. And even if some of the products are not quite there in some cases and, and superstars in others, yeah, it's not... I think that you, know, you you can't avoid that you live in a multi-cloud world because clients, some, you, people sign enterprise deals whether you like it or not, different deals. So you have to be able to cater for that. But when it comes to choosing your own infrastructure, I mean, I, uh, I, look, I grew up with Amazon. Okay. I love them. I still think they're great. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it's like we all do. It's like, but there are other choices. Yeah. It's like the BBC. There are other, for balance, there are other people out there. I think what, what Google needs is actually it's it's actually more marketing to be honest because the products themselves are are actually pretty good to be to be very very English and very conservative. There's some really good technology here, positioning it, and actually getting people to adopt it. These are not trivial things to get people to do, but yet the technology base is solid, supports good, commercials work, and we're extremely pleased with it to be honest. Yeah, and it's 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 giving us a really good substrate for the next phase of things we need to do internally. And then we can work out how we do the distribution um, you know, to other platforms as necessary afterwards. It's really cool. Awesome. Mark, I, I really appreciate you taking the time with our audience. They are, they, they are a bunch of feisty folks like <laughs> you. So uh, I appreciate the handling my weirdo questions and, and distractions. But um, thanks for thanks for taking the cycles. That's Looking pleasure. forward to continuing to support and do our best to help. Awesome. No, thanks very much indeed. Appreciate the, all the support for you guys are giving us too. Cheers, guys. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Take care. Bye. Thank you for listening to Cloud and Clear. Check the show notes for links to this week's topics. And don't forget to connect with us on Twitter at Cloud and Clear and our website, sada.com. Be sure to rate and review the show on your favorite podcast app.